So I run the MIT Self-Assembly Lab, and we focus on two main topics, which you saw in the video. One of those is self-assembly, which means individual components that come together on their own to build precise final structures. And the other one I'm going to talk about today, which is programmable materials. And I got into this work uh, through the design world, actually. I was studying architecture, and it was a moment when software was flooding design. And that's probably nothing new to all of us here, that software radically changed how we design and what we can design. Computing allowed us to make massive iterations. It allowed us to make geometric complexity. It allowed us to analyze our designs, simulate um, the geometry, the mechanical properties, the environmental properties, et cetera. So code became a new language for design. And it's also something that's probably nothing new to, to everyone here, but code became a new language for machines. Code became a language that we can program machines. Can we take the screensaver off, please? <laughs> code became a new language for screensavers. So code became a new language for machines. It allowed us to make things that we couldn't make before. This is a 3D printer, but you can replace it with a CNC router, a water jet, etc. So code for design, code for machines. And where I think we are right now is code for materials. We're having the same revolution that we saw in the software space, and we're having that in material science. Whether that's radical new material properties or the ability to program materials to make decisions, change shape, change property, respond to energy, et cetera. So I think we're in the midst of a material revolution. My lab specifically looks at large scale systems rather than micro to nano scale systems where you mostly see self-assembly or programmable materials. We look at construction, manufacturing, product assembly, et cetera. And we're interested in finding ways to reinvent the processes by which our materials come together and reinvent how we interact with products, how smart these materials and these systems can be. And most people will say, at large scales, if you look at construction or if you look at manufacturing, robots will save us. Robots are the key to, the, to solving all of our efficiency problems, all of our energy, our tolerance, our human labor issues. Let's throw everything at robots, they'll fix it. And we sort of agree with this. There's a lot of nice things about robots, but we want to drop all the robots. We want robots without robots. We want soft, agile, flexible, responsive robots. We essentially want material robots. And that's exactly what we focus on. So that's a topic called programmable matter, which is the science, engineering, and design of physical matter that has the ability to change form and function in a programmable fashion. So it means that we can program physical matter to respond, make decisions, change shape, et cetera. And the way that we do that is we have a, a couple key ingredients. On the left-hand side is kind of the obvious part, the materials and geometry. So we all know that materials respond to energy. They expand, they shrink, they curl, they respond to all different energy sources. The geometry is sort of the mechanical properties of it. How much material do I put, deposit? If I put more material, maybe it's stronger. If I put less material, maybe it's more flexible. If I put it in oscillating patterns, maybe it'll have one behavior or another. And the behavior that it produces is the second ingredient. Does it fold? Does it curl? Does it stretch? Does it shrink? What are the properties that we want to embed in that material itself? And the last ingredient is energy. And we utilize energy to activate the materials and geometry so that it has precise behaviors. We're specifically interested in passive energy sources, so heat, light, moisture, sound, et cetera, rather than our traditional forms of energy, power, and electronics, et cetera. So we've done a number of different projects in this space. I'm going to try to talk about two of them. Probably our most notable work from the lab is something called 4D printing. So we took the idea of 3D printing, and we said we want to add time, the fourth dimension. And we want things to not just be static objects that we print, but we want them to transform, to reconfigure, to have a life, that they adapt over time. And the way that we do that is by printing with different materials. So we collaborated with Autodesk and Stratasys on this project. It's still very much ongoing. We deposit two different materials in this case. One of those is a rigid plastic. That rigid plastic to me is like the braille. It's the geometric information. It's the structure, it's the backbone, the angles, the precision, it's the geometry for everything that it's going to do. And then the other material is an expanding polymer. It expands 150% when it meets moisture and that allows it to go from one state to another state. So that's the energy to transform. 
We've worked a lot with Autodesk on new software tools so that we can simulate what we're physically building and vice versa. The first step is to say, if I have a design, let's simulate what's going to happen. The next step is to say, I want something. I want to go from a table to a chair. Can we optimize the solution? Once it starts to get pretty complex, we need new design tools. We need to rethink how we design so that we can go from digital, physical, and back and forth. We've done a lot of different prototypes from strands that fold into text to two-dimensional objects, three-dimensional objects. This is a flat sheet folding into a truncated octahedron. Uh, each angle has a precise, um, a precise angle to get to that shape. And it shows that you can have flat materials that minimize volume, minimize time. You can ship them flat, and then they assemble on the other side. We then showed um, double curvature. And this is interesting for the apparel, footwear, automotive, aviation, or even building industry. There's a huge challenge in all of those industries when you go from rigid flat sheets to complex curvature. Normally, normally that takes difficult molding, uh, forming processes, um, or you're trying to force these materials into shape. But rather, what we've shown is that if you have local stretching across the surface and you can program how much stretching you have, you can predict positive and negative curvature across that surface. So you can have sheets that self-form, essentially. But the real question was, after we introduced this about a year or so ago, many different companies came to us and they said, well, can you do it with this material? Or can you do it with this energy? Or we don't really want crappy plastics. We want it to be in carbon fiber. We want it to be in all these different materials. So the question was, how can we program every material and not just utilize the printing that we had done before, but make any material programmable so that it could adapt in, in many different applications. So what I'm going to show now is some of our most recent work. We haven't shown it before, uh, and it's a collaboration with a number of people. We, we're calling this suite of materials programmable materials, and it's an, an amazing team and a collaboration from product designers like Christoph Guberin to Eric Domain, mathematician, computer scientist, and origami master, looking at the algorithms for folding, to Carbotex, who makes advanced materials. Specifically, they make flexible carbon fiber, which allows us to make programmable carbon fiber. And as I mentioned, Autodesk, rethinking software for programmable matter. We've done programmable carbon, which I've talked about. We've done textiles that change shape and function. We've done wood. And specifically, wood is an interesting one, because wood has this legacy. Everyone knows that wood curls when it gets wet. If you've seen veneer furniture, that it's going to curl when there's too much moisture. And we've seen that from Japanese joinery, uh, where they would put pe pegs into the joints, and as the moisture increased, it would swell to make it tighter or, or fit better. We've seen Eames furniture, who made this on a mass scale uh, and manufactured many of these with wood that folds into precise curvature for the chair. Or even more recently, Aki Menges at the University of Stuttgart is programming wood. It's veneer that can open and close for different apertures in buildings and programming it based on the grain direction and the orientation. But the two challenges that you face in using wood as this smart material, number one, the Eames case, is that there's a lot of energy that goes into steaming wood and forming wood. You're basically forcing it into place to do something you want it to do. Or two, on the, on the newer side, you're basically limited by, by the grain direction. So it's sort of like you have to go to the forest and find a random tree that would, that would turn right. If I want to spell MIT with wood, which everyone obviously wants to do, you'd have to find a really weird tree that had MIT in the grain. But, so we don't want to do that. We want the properties of wood, but we want to be able to completely customize the grain. So what we've been able to do is actually print with wood. We print, which is a mixture of um, wood particles and plastics, and then we can print our own grain. So we can change the density of the wood, we can create curved grains, we can create right angle grains, divergent grains, et cetera. And we're interested in using this for a number of different applications. Here you're seeing two different grain directions, um, which are then wet, and after they're wet, they curl. You get positive and negative curvature here. We then went on to show precise folding, so from a flat sheet to 90 degree angles, uh, positive and negative curvature, which creates these sine wave shapes. And then we, we had a nod or a riff on the Eames. If anyone knows the Eames furniture, they did this famous elephant toy. 
um, with the hope that actually you can print these structures and then they fold into very precise things like an arbitrary elephant um, and we're doing other furniture and, and kind of consumer or home goods where you have the feel and the behavior of wood but you can now program it like it's any other material. With carbon fiber, as I mentioned, we're working with Carbitex who makes flexible carbon fiber. And we can CNC spot where it's flexible, where it's rigid, and then we print within that carbon fiber active materials to make it transform. So here you're seeing a flexible sheet of carbon fiber and we've printed at the joint to make it fold at 90 degrees. And it's completely reversible, which is a, a new development since our previous work, that it can go back and forth, back and forth. Here you're seeing it fold based on heat, and we've done it heat, light, moisture, and I think there's many other applications or, or let's say energy activation mechanisms. So we've done folding and curling. And with Autodesk, as I, as I mentioned, we're trying to rethink how we design this. The first step is that we want to simulate the folding. We want to say, if I start from this flat sheet, what would it fold into? But the second is that we're correlating the material properties. So we'll produce a number of different tests with carbon fiber or with wood. We'll extract the data from that and we'll input that into the software so that our simulations are much more accurate. But then it also outputs a file that we can produce, that we can fabricate with, we, that we can print these materials and have a good understanding that it's gonna transform in the ways that we want it to. I'm gonna show a couple different case studies that we worked on recently with with different companies. The first is with Airbus. Um, Airbus on the top of their engine has this air inlet. So this inlet allows air to come into the engine and cool it as it's flying. But the problem is that this hole causes a lot of drag. When you're on the ground, it's fine because it allows the engine to cool. When you're up in the air, it's reducing aerodynamics. So you have two options. You could either live with the fact that you have a lot of drag or you could create these flaps just like they have on the wings, et cetera but they don't want to add mechanical or robotic flaps because it adds a lot of weight, it adds failure prone mechanisms, and then they need a control mechanism in the cockpit, which will halt manufacturing, et cetera. So what they really want is they want a, a thin sheet of material that can open and close autonomously and can control the airflow. When you're on the ground, you want it to be, be open as much as possible to increase the airflow. When you're in the air, you want it to close so, and control the amount of air so that you minimize drag but you can still get a bit of air to, to cool the engine. This is a piece of carbon fiber opening and closing to control the airflow. We've also worked with BAC, who's actually outside. You can see their car, the Mono, um, on a similar application, but here for aerodynamics. So if you look at the rear wing of, of any sports car or race car, um, it's actually nothing new to have adaptive aerodynamics. And we've seen that for years in planes, cars, boats but all of that is electromechanical, that there is pistons and, and motors and sensors and electronics moving these panels up and down to control the aerodynamics, which I said before adds weight, adds control and failure prone mechanisms. So what we really want is a flap that can open autonomously, but it's a single sheet of material to minimize weight. And so here you're seeing this rear wing in the up position, which causes a lot of drag, which increases traction when you need it, and here in the down position, which increases aerodynamics. So this is a cross section through the wing, and you can see the turbulence smooth out as it goes down to increase aerodynamics and increase as it goes up to uh, increase drag. Here's a prototype that we've been developing. It's a single sheet of carbon fiber that um, curls to increase drag and, and flattens out to increase aerodynamics. And so you can imagine on the back of a, of a car that you have this panel, let's say it gets uh, wet, it starts raining, you wanna increase traction, then your panels open up, uh, increases traction, increases the downforce. Uh, when it dries out, your panel closes, so you increase aerodynamics and you can go much faster. So adaptive tuning in aerodynamics, I think is a huge application for some of these materials. So all of this work, I think, is pointing to the fact that we need to re-envision or reimagine our product life cycle from how we make materials or the materials that we start with all the way to the products themselves. And we want this to be a more programmable life cycle. We want this to be adaptive, resilient, and um, programmable in the sense that there can be logic, sensing, and actuation in the materials themselves. 
the materials that we're using, we don't want them to be some super high-tech, expensive, hard-to-manufacture materials. We want them to be everyday materials. Every material that we use in this room, every material that we use in industrial manufacturing, but we want to be able to use the material properties, the geometry, the behavior of that, and activate it with energy so that it can behave in a predictable and programmable fashion. In manufacturing, we want the materials to either assemble themselves or collaborate with humans and robots to assemble more precise things or better things. We want materials to respond to physics and make decisions that can inform robotics how to assemble the next step or tell us how to make better products. In shipping, most people will say, you should talk to Ikea, because this is exactly what we want. We want to flat pack things, and we want it to assemble on the other side. Sort of the obvious one. But the next one is that packaging. There's a lot of effort put into packaging and protecting your goods as it's shipped. So we want smarter packaging that can protect, protect it based on impact or environmental fluctuations. You can imagine the environment is very different when you're in a plane versus on ground versus the carrier delivering it to your door. The products themselves, I think, can be completely reinvented. Um, the products should now be adapting to our performance. They should be changing when I change my performance or when I change my needs, but they should all be, also be changing when the environment uh, is responding. So a good example is shoes. Everyone has a different pair of shoes for everything you do. You have walking shoes, you have running shoes, you have shoes for when you're playing soccer, etc. We want our shoes to adapt. So if I start running, I want them to change so that my performance changes. If I'm on grass, I want them to grow cleats. If it starts raining, I want them to be waterproof. If it's hot, I want them to dry out or, or cool my feet. And you can think of the same thing for almost every product, that you want them to be smarter. Every product in this room is more or less static. The chairs don't care who's sitting on it. It's the same chair. And we over-engineer these chairs to, be, um, to not respond to who's sitting on it. And the last one is probably the most important. We want products that repair themselves when they fail. We want products that reconfigure themselves when they're outdated. And we want products that self-disassemble for recyclability. So I think this is all pointing to the fact that it's now possible to program nearly every material to assemble itself and transform in useful ways, leading us to the fact that we can create robots without robots. Thanks so much. It's kind of wow. So yesterday, Andrew Hessel was telling us that we can program DNA Skylar, you're telling us we can program physical materials. I think a lot of people here are just getting their head around 3D printing and additive manufacture. Mm -hmm. How long until this becomes an average everyday part of hardware manufacturing for the products in our homes? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and people often ask us that, like, when are we going to see your first product out there? And, and I try to remind them, you know, we're a research lab, so our goal is to invent things, to make the wildest stuff you can ever imagine. Uh, push knowledge forward, but one of the key things that we've been trying to do specifically in the past couple years is work with great companies and try to implement these technologies. So we hope that there's some in the next couple of years that are implemented, and, and I think some of the examples I showed today are, are ripe op uh, opportunities. But realistically, the, it's not a technological challenge. That I think we've shown we can easily do this in a very short amount of time. It's really an ad adoption challenge. Like, How do we meet all the regulations, but also have the idea that we can change our products with these new types of materials. And if you weren't researching, if you decided to set up a business that could capitalize on one particular aspect of this technology, what kind of product do you think you'd create? Yeah, um, you're asking me to pick favorites of which ones. Well, which um, one do you think has the most commercial application? Yeah, so the first industry that came to us was apparel and footwear. And I think that's a really ripe one. Um, but you know, aviation, the medical space, uh, automotive, all of these industries are extremely focused on new technologies. And they work very fast. And, and to me, that's super exciting. Where if you look at the building industry, I first studied architecture. I wish that we could make huge advances there. But it's so much slower. Everyone's afraid of getting sued. Building codes are outdated. It's like you can't make huge leaps like you can in other industries. So. I think the ones that I showed are really exciting, fast-paced ones. Very cool shoes as well. Uh, Skylar Tibbetts. So <laughs>